just stay standing for just a minute. The last few months have been a real challenge. Uh, you know, I've been a pastor for 34 years, and I've never, um, you know, I've always been a Calvary chaplain and been a centerpiece, you know, in the big mouth and the most visible person. And so the last few months, my wife and I have been challenged on where we're going to go to church. And uh, three or four times, we, we tended to, I went first by myself, Radiant Church in Tampa. Great church. Love that church. And every service I was at, every service I was at, the first service, I got to go up to that pastor. I got to go up to that pastor and look him in the eye and say, I shook his hand and I said, I want you to know, and I started choking up. That message was for me. Second service I went, and there was a song, and the song. Third service I took my wife, and there was a song like that last one. And my wife and I, my wife just knelt and began to weep. And I began, good God spoke to us in the song. And the Lord said, my spirit, just before I come up here, that song was for some of you. This service is for somebody. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you speak to us. You know where we live. You know what we're facing. I thank you. Uh, you've spoken so clearly and repeatedly to my wife and I these last few months. Or someone in a very difficult circumstance this morning. And you want to encourage them and you already have. Lord, we receive that encouragement. Just through this song, you're a mountain moving God. You're a God who never fails us. You never change. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you. Amen. 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 And have a seat. If you... I may be seated. One of the uh, devotionals I've been using for my time with the Lord in the morning, I've used it many times, but it's very fresh. Um, with that said, uh, My Utmost for His Highest by Oswald Chambers. I understand they have a new one out. Actually, my wife gave our third son, who was leading the worship, uh, the newer modern version. So if you're interested in trying it out and you like the new modern English, I got the old English version, uh, and that's working out fine. Uh, you know, finally I can understand those words. Um, but let me read you one of the mornings this past week, just a section of it. Listen carefully. There are times when God cannot lift the darkness from you. But trust Him. God will appear like an unkind friend, but He is not. He will appear like an unnatural father, but He is not. He will appear like an unjust judge, but He is not. You can rest, there's the word that Jump out. You can rest in perfect confidence in Him. If you were with us at Sweat Park last Sunday, <laughs> Hebrews chapter 3, I did not read it, but I want to read a section of it this morning. Hebrews chapter 3, and I'm using my New King James Version Bible. Bear with me. Hard to find things in a new Bible. And it reads a little different. Verse 14. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said today, if you hear His voice, don't harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. And then this has a heading before the next verse, failure of the wilderness wanderers. Now we will get back, promise, we will get back to just expository teaching. But right now we're kind of in the wilderness. And I didn't do it because we're in the wilderness, it's just what God laid on my heart. And so we'll continue next Sunday at the Palladium but we're on the other side of the wilderness next week in the land of promise. 
Whoa, don't get so excited yet. You know what's in the land of promise? Giants. Next Sunday. Verse 16. For who having heard rebel? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry 40 years? 40 years. 40 years. Was it not that with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his, here's the word, enter his rest? But to those who did not obey. So we see that they could not enter in to the rest because of their unbelief. In chapter 4, therefore since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. Now, without reading the rest of the passage, ten times I mentioned last Sunday, ten times in these short verses here, ten times you find the word rest. That was where God was trying to lead them to, a place of rest. What does it mean? Well, rest is to be quiet, to be tranquil, not agitated by fear. Giants. Or anxiety. Now, what would cause anxiety? Well, during the wilderness wandering, He would lead them for days sometimes. Remember, God's leading them. And for three days, they couldn't find water. You want to live, you need water. But God led them. They would, they would travel for days. They didn't have any food. They would crave the food from where they came from, Egypt, the type of the world. And yet God said, wait a minute, I got food from heaven for you. Manna. The place God's looking to lead us is the promised land. The literal promised land, the literal wandering, lessons for us. Let me give you the sword of the wilderness wandering. It's called life. And in your travel, you're going to have some tough times. And what we sometimes don't realize, it's God leading us. It's God in His sovereignty orchestrating the circumstances. The promised land is not heaven. If the promised land were heaven, there'd be no giants there. <laughs> the giants are enemies of the people of God. And they are possessing what God wants to give us. And if you're going to possess everything God wants, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but just to whet your appetite for next Sunday, you're going to have to face some giants. And by faith, conquer some giants. And if you're going to possess everything and all the blessings God has for you in the land of promise, you're going to have to face some giants. Next Sunday. Doug and Kathy, I don't know if Doug and Kathy are here. Doug and Kathy, who my wife and I met with last week. Are you here this morning? What a blessing for us to meet with Doug and Kathy. And Part of our fellowship didn't even know it. Doug had a stroke two years ago and it saved his life. Yeah, I got that right. Doug had a stroke two years ago and it saved his life. And if you heard the story, we listened for an hour and I wasn't bored the whole hour. Saved Doug's life. He's a walking miracle. He should be dead. But he's alive spiritually now. And Doug and Kathy faced the daily challenges of Doug being disabled and everything is a chore. His shower that his wife has, it's a chore. But man, when after hearing their story and then they hand over uh, an envelope with cash for Calvary Chapel Fellowship, something that they don't have extra. But from the other woman that Doug was married to for years, his F-350 truck, this is his words. I was married to two women. One my truck and the other my wife. And she's over there nodding. She said it was, he said it was stand up. Just like it was stand right straight up. Doug's a redneck. That's why we got along so good. 
And they told us their story. And here he is. And he, he, would, he would probably six or seven times during that hour break out in tears. And his wife would lean over and she'd go, happy tears? Yes, yes, happy tears. <laughs> and then he stood up. And in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, and my wife and I, she, he reaches out this envelope and hands it to me and presenting it in the name of Jesus for Calvary Chapel Fellowship. And we're just bawling like babies. And I said at the end of that conversation, I said, Doug, can't. And they know enough about the Word of God. I said, you are living in the promised land. Kathy began to nod. Doug began to cry. And they knew what I meant. The struggles they're facing, the challenges they're facing, but they're resting. Their marriage is filled with joy. It was obvious. Like never before, like nothing like before. When the first woman was in Doug's life, the truck. By the way, the money came from the sale of the truck because he he's disabled. What a story. Put up Deuteronomy, baby, if it's working now. We've had challenges, but hey, it's working. Here. Remember how the Lord your God led you. The Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart. As I've said many times, let me say again. God didn't need to know what was in our heart, what was in their heart. God knows what's in your heart. He wants us to know. I want to show you. I want to lead you. I want to lead you into circumstances that are very difficult. And sometimes even if you go, I don't even have enough money to live or I don't have enough to live. And that's what he did. He led them. They didn't have water. They didn't have food. And, and you go, what in the world is happening? Well, God's trying to show you what's in your heart. Because here's what happens. Here's what happens. 99 times out of 100. 99 people out of 100. Maybe 100 out of 100. You complain. <laughs> You question God. You don't have faith. And so one of the first things God wants to do in the wilderness of life is purge our hearts. And there's where all the problems come from. Jesus said it. He says it's not what goes into your mouth. What goes into your mouth, it gets digested and then flushed. Thank God for the flush. <laughs> But it's what comes out of the mouth, because out of the heart, there's where our problems are. It's a heart. You think it's the circumstances. You think it's your boss. You think it's your wife. You think it's your husband. You think it's whatever. It's not. It's the heart. Second scripture. Here it is. Consider it pure joy. This is one of the verses you love and you hate. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. Because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work. That's a process. So that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. The mature and complete is when you're in the promised land. you still got battles to fight. you still got deeper to go, more to possess. You're going to have to face some giants next Sunday. But this is the place God is looking to bring all of us in life, the wilderness journey, to a place you go, man, five years ago, I'd have got so bent out of shape, I'd have questioned God, I'd have wondered, what, what's going on? Now I realize it's just another step. Amen. Thank you, you can take those down. Now listen carefully. There are two overall purposes for the wilderness wandering in terms of what God wants to do in each of us, me included, all of us. Here's the first. To purge our heart. To know what's in our heart. Now how are you going to know until all of a sudden you get married and you wake up one day and you go, you're not the woman I thought I married. <laughs> and you know why people laugh? It's because everybody deals with that. Unless you're newly wed. But sometimes, God forbid, it happens to newlyweds. And if that's you, oh, God help you. <laughs> but right now, if you're newlywed, you're still, you're still cruising, man. You ain't, hit, you ain't hit the real wilderness yet. And all of a sudden, you've lost your job. 
All of a sudden, you're not the pastor of the church you pastored 34 years. <laughs> Who are you talking to? <laughs> and you go, what in the world is going on? I didn't choose this. But God knows. It's to purge us. To see what's in our heart. What are you going to do now? Isn't it interesting? God didn't really test Abraham until years later. And the greatest test was to offer your son, your one and only son. I find the greatest test, and this, I hope this is encouraging, but the greatest test comes later in life. I've been walking with the Lord a long time, and the last eight months have been the most difficult, some of the most difficult of my life. But guess what? And my wife is here to testify, and my children will testify. I've gone deeper. I've gone wider. I, the, the grapes are bigger. The, 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 melons, the melons are more juicy. Listen, I'm living the dream of the promised land. Still battles to fight, giants to face. But my marriage is off the chart blessed. My family is off the chart blessed. I got peace. I got joy that nobody can take from me. Amen. Listen, listen, that's just a testimony. That's not me. God wants to do that for every one of us. Amen. But it is a journey. And the journey doesn't end until heaven. The promised land is not heaven. First thing in the wilderness, purge our heart. Second thing, second overall thing God wants to do, purge our heart. Second, prompt our faith. Faith can't grow until the heart's been purged. You with me? Mm -hmm. yes. Purge our heart, prompt our faith. Now, one little side note. And by the way, we're trying very, very hard that during this wilderness of moving about, Palladium, Pinellas Park, Sweat Park, wherever we are, um, we're trying very hard to make the service one hour for the sake of the children, but just, just trying to do one hour. So you're going, well, that means you've got to be done by 12. And I know for you regulars that have, I've been your pastor for a long time, that will take a miracle. I believe in miracles. But we're shooting for noon. But let me give you a very important little curveball here. Wilderness, journey of life, purge our heart, prompt our faith. But while God is testing us, Satan takes the opportunity. And let me just give you the reference. James chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. For the sake of time. James chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. When tested, New King James Version said when tempted, but really the better translation is there, verse 12, when tested. Or when tempted, let me get it right. When tempted, no one should say God is tempting me, because God doesn't tempt anyone, nor is he tempted by evil. Now, Jesus was tempted as a man. Don't misunderstand that. As a man. To show he fulfilled all righteousness. He made it. He's our example. Our Michael Jordan, if you will. But, testing... God's leading us. God's testing us to mature us. Satan, during the testing, looks to tempt us. James will go on to say we're tempted when by our own evil desire we're dragged away and we're enticed. Satan, to be technical, does the enticing. Oh yeah, that, that'll do it. Oh yeah, she's a babe, ain't she? That's what you need. Yeah, but it's not the babe for you. Or if it is the babe for you, then keep it pure until you say, until death do us part. I now pronounce you husband and wife. A rare thing in our day. But if you really love God, that's what you're going to do. And if you're not doing it, you're going to make a decision to go back and do it right. Amen. So while God's testing, Satan's roaring like a lion. He's going and he's looking for someone to devour. 1 Corinthians 10, as Hebrews that I just read, tells us that so many in that first generation in the wilderness wandering, guess what? They fell to temptation. Over 20,000 Israelite men in one day fell to sexual sin. And they never went into the land of promise. They never enjoyed what God had for them. Some never ended up 
trusting the Lord in the circumstances of life and they just kept complaining and murmuring and murmuring and they tested the Lord and they were destroyed. And they never ended in the land of promise. So while God is testing, Satan is saying, oh, okay, that's, oh, that's the God you, you're going to follow. And he's doing exactly what he did to Eve in the Garden of Eden. Did God say? And you doubt the goodness of God. I love book I read during our what I call exile when we were submitted initially to pastor serve and I'm not going to get into that there is no surer formula for discontent than to try and satisfy our cravings for the ocean of infinite love from the teacup of finite satisfactions I know you need me to read it again there is no surer formula for discontent than to try and satisfy our cravings for the ocean of infinite love from the teacup of finite satisfaction. That's what happened to so many during the wilderness wanderings. They craved the food of Egypt. We had it better back there. You know, it was better before I committed my life. Yeah, right. You were a slave. So in order to overcome temptation, my heart needs to be purposed. Get my heart right. Now, let's fast forward. Whole generation, new generation comes along. Joshua chapter 3 verse 5. And again, for the sake of time, let me just give you this reference. Joshua 3 verse 5. Here's what Joshua, and by the way, Joshua has to lead us into the land of promise. Moses can because Moses represents law. And you'll never get there by trying to muster it up. Yeah, you gotta, you got to make decisions, but it's God. And it's Jesus. Jesus is the Old Testament Joshua. Joshua is the Old Testament Jesus. So here comes Joshua, and here's the first thing he says, Joshua 3, 5. Consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow, the Lord will do amazing things. Wilderness wandering, heart purged, faith prompted, and once the heart is purged, you're not perfect, you're not perfect. But, you're at a point, you say, okay God, I'm going to trust you, and you... Consecrate your life. They say, Lord, I'm making a complete commitment to you. No half-heartedness, no offense thing. You know, I know, Lord, I'm yours. Consecrate yourself. And once heart purged, faith prompted, consecration, Joshua 3, 13. You know what that is? The priests. We're all New Testament priests. This is for everybody, not for a select few. The priests are to go to the Jordan River, and the Jordan is what stands between us and the land of promise. And you're to put your foot forward into the water. And the Jordan is at flood stage. That's God, isn't it? It's not a convenient time to take a step. Life is rushing and things are so busy. But no, no, no. Take a step of faith. Now, that step of faith can be all kind of different situations in a Christian's life. But here's what it all boils down to. Let me bring it to a very simple understanding. James is the one that tells us. Here's what he says. Don't merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Take a step. He says that several times. Don't you know that faith without works is dead? There are people in churches all over the nation this morning hearing the Word, hopefully hearing the Word, and they'll leave and their lives will be no different after going to church and they go back into their world in their wilderness. Stepping your foot into the Jordan is very simply taking a step of faith. And it could be all kind of different things. It's, it's taking that first step to say, you know what? I'm stopping with the sexual sin. And I'm taking a step of faith. And you go to the girlfriend, you go to the boyfriend, you say, you know what? This is just not going to work. I made a fresh commitment to the Lord and I'm not going to live this way anymore. And that's a big step. It's this pornography is killing me spiritually. 
For some, it's just simple as I've been going to church for 40 years and I've never, ever decided to read the Word on a regular basis myself. So those steps of faith can be all kind of different things. But it's, it's putting feet to your faith. It's showing that I'm not just a churchgoer. I'm really a Christian. Amen. Right. You get your feet wet. Here's the question. As it's 11.53. <laughs> Just in case you didn't know. The only person that can stand in the way of you and the abundant blessings God has for you in life is you. Heart purged. Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for what's in my heart. I'm a mess. And we're all messes without Jesus. Lord, I want to learn to trust you. I want to learn to trust you. And in trusting you, I'm going to take the first step. And you know what that is. Whatever that is. I'm going to begin to live it out and not just be a church coach. And you begin to walk by faith. And then next week, you begin to face the giants. And don't, let me just let you know ahead of time, if you're already in the promised land and you're facing the giants and you go, what in the world are these giants doing in my life? Well, they're keeping you from going further, deeper. From your marriage, even though your marriage might be okay, or your marriage might be good, God doesn't want it just to be good. He wants this to be abundant. Overflowing. A land flowing with milk and honey. But there are giants that have to be conquered. What's well, standing in between you and your promised land? When Diane Nayad was nine years old, she stood on a beach in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, a hundred nautical miles away, Fidel Castro's revolution was in full swing. And young Diane asked her mother, Mom, where is Cuba? I can't see it. Exactly where is Cuba? Diane's mother pulled her close they gazed at the seemingly endless ocean, and then she pointed toward the horizon, and she said, there, it's right over there, Diane. You can't see it, but it's so close, you could almost swim there. That day a dream was conceived in Diana's heart. A dream of becoming the first person to swim across the Straits of Florida. When Diana tried and failed in 1978, at the age of 29, the dream went dormant for more than three decades. But it did not die. In 2011, Diana tried and failed again. And again. And again. And then on September the 2nd, 2013, Diana gave it one more try at age 64. 53 hours and 110 statute miles later, Diana Niyad fulfilled her dream and became the first person to swim from Cuba to Florida without the help of a shark cage. There's a woman. When asked what enabled her to overcome all the giant obstacles along the way, Diana simply says, you must set your will. That's our part. I'm going to make a decision, Lord. Forgive me. I consecrate my life to you. I'm going to take some steps of faith. And then God does... In time, there are giants to face. 
Listen, we're going to close, but listen. My wife is back in the little cubby right here. My, my wife will testify. My marriage is better than it's ever been. Ever. Ever. My family closer than we've ever been. And I'm living now. There are battles to face, but every day. You know what I love? You know what I love more than anything? I went fishing yesterday on a Saturday. Didn't have to go to a Saturday night service. It was weird. <laughs> We got beat up. <laughs> we caught fish. I forget what the point was. <laughs> but you know what I missed yesterday? Because we left the dock at 6 a.m. And as much as I love the fellowship with the men that went with me, and as much as I love catching again, it's been, it's been months. It's been months. You know what I miss? My quiet time now because I don't really have a real job. <laughs> My quiet time minimally is an hour and a half. And it's not something I get up and I go, man, I got to get in the Word. I get up and I go, I get to get in the Word. <laughs> and for the last several months, it's not been to preach a sermon. It's been just to be with my Lord. And the riches. The riches of my marriage, the riches of my family. But listen, what I'm, my point is, that's not just for me. That's for you. That's for anybody. Right. Here's how we're going to close. Jerry and Savannah are going to come. We're going to sing one song, one song, one song. And here's what I invite you to do. Some of you, you're never going to enter the land of promise because your first step, guess what your first step is? You've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You may believe in God. You may have grown up in church. I don't know. You may have been, this may be your first time in church. I don't know. But the Holy Spirit right now is drawing you and saying, you need to receive Jesus. You need to give your life to Jesus because until you give your life to Jesus, He can't give His life to you. Did you hear that? Until you give your life to Jesus, He can't give His life to you. That's your first step. But for... Others of us, you know Christ. But even if you made a fresh commitment last week, guess what? A week's gone by. You've been in the wilderness. You could have failed again. Well, make a fresh commitment. You say, I committed my life last week. Well, start again. Diana never gave up. Get back up. A righteous man falls seven times and he rises again. The wicked fall into calamity. Get back up. Get back on the road. Simple song of faith and consecration. I'm going to ask you, if you're coming to receive Jesus, come. If you're coming to make a fresh commitment, come. We're not organized enough yet. We don't have tissues down here for you. We don't have nice carpeted steps you can kneel on. That's okay. You come. And after we sing the song with us all gathered, you're coming to make a commitment to Christ or a recommitment to Christ. And then I'm going to pray and then we're done. Come on as we sing. decisions for you this morning. And Lord, I believe some have made decisions and they didn't physically come forward, but you know their hearts. Lord, bless your people. Continue to lead us, guide us. Thank you for your faithfulness. And Lord, help us to become like you. Faithful to you as you are faithful to us. Continue to guide us as a church fellowship. We thank you in advance. In Jesus' name, Amen. I'll be in the lobby. God bless you guys. Have a great day.